Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Glad you're with us today. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And we have a person today that's not been on our show before. Hail to the Chief, we call this show. Hail to the Chief Justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Uh, we have had the Chief Justice on from time to time, but those that position uh, changes. And we're having a new Chief Justice, or relatively new, uh, James Edmondson, come on and visit with us and tell us what's going on at the, out at the Supreme Court. There's always a lot going on. Look forward to that conversation. It's coming up today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Ryan Leonard for Attorney General, a former prosecutor and fighter who will lock up child predators and drug dealers, one of the first to call for a constitutional challenge to the Obama-Pelosi health care bill. Like most Oklahomans, I'm concerned about the direction our country is headed. I'll fight to protect our families, and I will fight to defend our constitutional freedoms. And when Washington, D.C. overreaches, we'll push back and push back hard. Ryan Leonard, protecting our families, protecting our freedoms. The idea of sending American money out of our own economy these days for foreign oil is madness. Yet we're spending $25 billion a month on foreign oil. America's 100-year supply of natural gas can break this pattern and strengthen our economy. See how it can create jobs, generate clean electricity, fuel our cars, and protect our environment at chk.com. Chesapeake, America's champion of natural gas. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today we're really pleased to welcome the Honorable James Edmondson, the Chief Justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court, to our show. We've had uh, Chief Justices in the past uh, join us and talk about what's going on in the court, but we haven't had uh, Chief Justice Edmondson up to this point, and we're really pleased he'd join us. The Chief Justice uh, did his undergraduate work at Northeastern State University, did his law work at the Georgetown uh, Law Center. Uh, he uh, was a, in private practice. He was a prosecutor uh, for a number of years, both state and federal. For 20 years, he served as a district court judge in Muskogee County. And in 2003, he was appointed to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. In 2009, he became Chief Justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And this is his first visit. We sure hope not his last. Welcome, Mr. Thank Chief. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's nice to be with you all. Well, thank you for being here. I enjoy your program a lot, and it's uh, nice to be a part of it. Well, thank you. In Thanks. general, how are things going at the Supreme Court? We're uh, calm, uh, <laughs> but then again, we're notoriously calm in the Supreme Court. We try to be calm. Right now, we're in a temporary cessation of regularly scheduled conferences. We'll resume regularly scheduled conferences after Labor Day. This gives us a little time for opinion writing and some other projects that we have going on, such as mm -hmm. the finalization of a uniform case uh, management and information system that will expand our Oklahoma court information system from the 13 counties that are there to uh, all 77 counties. That is our uh, great hope uh, and we hope that uh, we can present that to the court as soon as we get back from the summer break. How is the Chief Justice selected? Well, the Constitution says that the uh, members of the Supreme Court shall choose a Chief Justice and a Vice Chief Justice. Uh, beyond that, the Supreme Court has developed a rule which calls for uh, two-year terms 
the uh, conference meets the first Thursday after a general election and finds out who the new chief, new vice chief are gonna be. Uh, my term will expire on December 31st and we'll welcome in a new chief. And the terms are for how long? Two years. Okay. Tell our viewers uh, uh, how the justices of the Oklahoma Supreme Court are selected. <clears throat> well, my experience was to go through uh, the, the uh, Judicial Nominating Commission and uh, that commission selected three uh, persons sent it to the governor and uh, Governor Henry appointed me. Uh, every two years, roughly a third of all the appellate judges will stand for retention by the voters. So that, that includes the Court of uh, Civil Appeals and the Court of Criminal Appeals. So uh, <clears throat> every uh, two years, three justices of the uh, Oklahoma Supreme Court stand for retention. That's generally so. There are terms uh, that uh, have only partially expired, and, and uh, but barring those kind of eventualities, vacancies, and so forth, you can expect that a third of all appellate judges will stand for retention or not at the public's pleasure every uh, general election. Let me expand on that a little bit. <clears throat> and when you're originally appointed, uh, is there a district from which you 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 are selected, or could it just be statewide? Uh, uh, yes, we have nine. Uh, Supreme Court districts and one uh, uh, justice from each district minus the uh, seventh district. Is that basically Muskogee and the surrounding area? Yes, yes. It's mm -hmm. the same district that produced uh, Senior uh, Justice uh, Hardy Summers, who still serves the court, along with Senior Justice uh, um, uh, Robert Lavender. Both are uh, willing to serve in, the, in our cases if we have a tie. And a disqualification. We need five votes to do virtually anything. To decide any question, I like to say even to go to lunch, but <laughs> the rule isn't quite that strict. Well, needing five votes is something I'm familiar with. That, that sounds yes, familiar sir. from City Hall. You would be. How has the role of a, of a justice or a chief justice um, evolved over the years? Is it pretty much the same now as it was 50 or 60 years ago? No, I wouldn't have any idea. <laughs> not that old, Your Honor. Well, does it take a, a change in the Constitution to, to, to bring up a, 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 a new way of, of handling issues? I, I couldn't even answer that. Uh, I'd, I'd need to read the briefs on the question. I, that one takes me by surprise. As far as I know, the Chief Justice is mainly an administrative and appointive uh, uh, entity. Uh, we, we try to keep an eye on, on uh, the executive and the legislature, just like they keep an eye on us. And uh, aside from that, the Chief Justice uh, makes some uh, uh, policy decisions, but doesn't adjudicate by himself. And I don't know that the role has been different mm -hmm. uh, from statehood. In general, are there more cases coming to the state Supreme Court now than there used to be, or is the number going up or down? <clears throat> I think we have uh, developed a good intermediate uh, appeal uh, system. Our Court of Civil Appeals is staffed by six judges in uh, Tulsa and six judges in Oklahoma City. They do a fantastic job. Uh, we can still review cases where it is asserted that the Court of Civil Appeals has erred, uh, but it doesn't take us long to review a case and determine that the Court of Civil Appeals has decided the question correctly and uh, to go on down the road. And they are so good that, yes, I would say <coughs> that our, our labors have become less onerous. Let me go back to the uh, retention ballot just for a minute. I know that originally you were selected because of your residency over in Muskogee County and qualifications uh, in, in uh, competition with other very qualified uh, candidates. But when you have to stand for a retention ballot, uh, do you stand statewide or just, uh, just from your district? It's statewide. So you're selected from a district, but then you stand for retention statewide. That's correct. Uh, so even though you're from Muskogee, if Oklahoma City and Tulsa should see something differently, that could impact the, potentially impact the outcome. Absolutely. Every, every vote has equal value. May I ask another, uh, something, sure. to go back to something you touched on uh, about the uh, information system. Uh, we have some counties now where you can get a lot of information about pending cases online. 
and that's going to be expanded uh, statewide so that all districts will be uh, uh, under that same system. That's our hope. But can you tell our viewers just kind of generally what kind of information is, is, is or will be available? Uh, the, the regular dockets of the district courts, the uh, information that's in the court clerk's office, uh, that's what uh, persons that I'm close to are primarily interested in, then case tracking up to uh, the uh, Court of Civil Appeals, the Court of uh, Criminal Appeals. Um, beyond that, we have uh, working interests with us so that, say, a trial judge can get bail information from all 77 counties. He's not a reigning uh, criminal defendant in the dark. He can find out whether there are bench warrants or body attachments in all 77 counties. The, the link up of the entire 77 counties of the state, I think, will be of immense benefit to all citizens, including business persons who'd like to know how many mortgage foreclosures there have mm -hmm. been, uh, whether or not there have been loan defaults. The uh, legislative analysts are excited about it because they will be able to see virtually within moments what the caseload is in each county, in each district court at the Court of Criminal Appeals, Court of Civil Appeals, and here. Mm -hmm. Of course, so the practicing bar is really enthusiastic about it because it <laughs> gives them an, uh, an avenue to find out about a particular case without having to drive to the county seat to ask to see the court file and to look at it. They'd be able to do it online, statewide now, which right. wasn't present mm -hmm. before. And eventually, they'll be able to do in our state courts what they can do in yeah. federal court, that's file a case from their own desk in their mm -hmm. law office. No more trips to Oklahoma City, no more trust in the mail. Well, we need more trips to Oklahoma City. So. Well, come on. <laughs> just, just in general. I'll call it home now. <laughs> How have your life experiences aided you in, in handling the role mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court, not just as the, as the Chief Justice, but on the Supreme Court? Because everyone that's brought into a position like this draws back on their experiences from, from childhood and, and beyond. Well, I think I had an equal balance uh, growing up professionally. I spent uh, five years in uh, general civil uh, uh, and criminal defense work. And then I spent uh, five years as a prosecutor, both state and federal. And then 20 years on the bench in, uh, in a le less populous area, five counties of the 15th Judicial District, uh, we kind of did everything. I mean, there weren't any specialists. There wasn't mm -hmm. an assignment to the family division or an assignment to the criminal division. The judges where I came from do all kinds of work, jacks of all trades. and. Uh, I think that rounded me out as a, mm -hmm. as a lawyer. I think I practiced almost every kind of law there was except <laughs> securities law and workers' compensation law. <laughs> We're so. going to take our first break and, and, and come back. Uh -huh. We're dealing with Chief Justice James Edmondson. We'll be right back on The Verdict. This can is called For All the Grandfathers, and I dedicate it to my grandfather, Franklin Allen. Me and him just had like a spiritual thing where I just learned lessons from him without him telling me anything. The three dots on the feather represent my immediate family, and as my grandfather told me about the Chickasaws, that family is the most important thing. To me, the eagle sees everything as our elders do, also representing my grandfather and his bravery in the Korean War. I actually just started on the wings for the eagles, and that's when my mother called and told me that he passed away. He took his journey. It's like somebody watching you when nobody's there. I guess he wanted me to finish it, so I finished it. He's been with me ever since. It shows how strong a Chickasaw family can be. The oil and natural gas industry helped provide a revenue that uh, feeds our schools, uh, providing a better education for not only my kids, but uh, for children all over the state. It will allow the schools to buy better equipment, we'll be able to hire qualified teachers, and all around to have a better educational experience. The future has never been brighter for our students here. We should be very proud of the oil and gas industry in Oklahoma.
Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent, where to now? Well, I'd like to ask the Chief Justice, uh, what uh, impact does being chief uh, and the administrative duties have on the uh, time you have available to uh, research and decide cases? The uh, administration uh, is, uh, is something that I confessed when I came on board as uh, chief that I was not very good at. Uh, it, is, it is not my primary desire to administer and officiate in, that, in those terms. So I'm very grateful for the brevity of the term Chief Justice. I would like to get back to deciding cases and um, opinion writing. I, I, I'm not sure if your viewers know this, but the Chief Justice does not get assigned cases. I'm not on the certiorari list. The vice chief who assigns the certiorari cases uh, does not have me uh, down for any work on that regard. And it is theoretically to free the chief up for the, the administrative uh, duties that he, he has. So I'll be glad to get back to uh, just being a regular horse pulling the, the wagon. Let me follow up on that just a little bit. <clears throat> the day before you were chief, you had a load of cases. And then the, the day after you were chief, you weren't any new ones. Did you just finish out the ones you had and then I, didn't I take think, on any new ones? I think we're virtually current. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I look forward to getting some assignments. Are nine justices enough to handle the, the workload that takes place? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was not always the case. Uh, we had uh, uh, to press into service some uh, other judges when we had uh, massive onslaughts of litigation. I fortunately wasn't here at that time. But uh, What era are you talking about there? Uh, there were some massive uh, changes in uh, the workers' compensation laws. Uh, as I have indicated, I knew about only remotely as a, as a trial judge. Uh, but that precipitated a great deal of litigation. Mm -hmm. When the legislature does uh, massive reforms, it's going to precipitate a massive onslaught of litigation. And then eventually the appellate courts will sort it out and determine <coughs> what was, if there's any mystery about it, the intent of the legislature and how the new laws are to be applied. Recently, the legislature just rewrote uh, the entire juvenile code, and I have not yet seen the appellate result of that, but I understand mm -hmm. it precipitated near panic at the trial uh, court level because it went into mm -hmm. effect immediately upon signing. So when, when these things happen, we need uh, all the resources we can get, and it is fortunate that we have a, a great trial bench and the wonderful uh, work of the Court of Criminal Appeals, which has exclusive jurisdiction in all criminal cases, and as I say, the Intermediate Court of Civil Appeals. Mm -hmm. And with those things intact, um, yeah, we've got, uh, compared to my 20 years as a trial judge, we have uh, law clerks who are distinguished lawyers in their own right. We have more pay and we have less work, so it's got to be a promotion. Is, are, are cases more complicated now than, than uh, when you started? Mm -hmm. The cases that we get uh, are complicated by nature. Um, otherwise, the Court of Civil Appeals will decide them, and 99% <clears throat> of the time they'll decide them correctly. Let's say another state uh, Supreme Court has dealt with a very similar, if not a, mm -hmm. a, an exact uh, similar, uh, exact same situation. Is that relevant as you look at it, or do you, do you solely look at Oklahoma? case law and the Oklahoma Constitution? No, we will search the United States for the jurisprudence uh, that is necessary to help us frame a decision on a first impression question that is brought to us. Mm -hmm. If we don't have guiding precedents, we do look to our neighbors, our sister states, and uh, get guidance from them. Just in, in general, how <clears throat> are cases assigned to uh, individual justices once uh, <laughs> they are properly in the court? Well, as I say, the uh, vice chief has a list, and uh, he assigns the new cases that we accept on review from the from courts below uh, on a rotational basis. The assignment has to be to a person who concurs in the granting of that right of review mm -hmm. uh, to, by the Supreme Court, uh, but other than that, it's a rotation. In cases that are filed with us where the lawyers suggest that we should retain it in order to avoid undue delay with an intermediate uh, decision knowing that there will probably be review by the Supreme Court or it's a first impression question, we can retain the appeal at the get-go, not assign it to one of the divisions of Court of Civil Appeals. And then the marshal of the Supreme Court 
uh, Nancy Parrott will make the, the assignment again on a rotational basis. Does that happen very often, the retention? Uh, I suppose it's suggested often by the lawyers that the court ought to retain it, but does it actually happen very often? If I were just to guess, I would say during the year and a half that I've been chief, we grant uh, a motion to retain less than 10 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. How many times a year does the court hear oral arguments and what's the nature of those cases? Our court uh, has four referees who are lawyers with a great deal of experience. They've been on the court, each of them, longer than I've been there by a long shot. They hear hundreds of oral presentations every year. Then they draft a memorandum that summarizes the pleadings of the case, the nature of the arguments that are being made by counsel and make a recommendation to us. Very rarely do we think that it's important to bring the lawyers back for further oral presentation. Usually their briefs and the referee's memorandum are quite adequate along with the record if there is one below. So we, uh, we do not grant oral argument in front of the entire court uh, as often as Dean Coates and some others might like us to. On the other hand, the oral presentations are gotten to the court through the referees. Now, if there's a case of uh, widespread public interest or something that affects the Constitution to an extent that many would be interested in the result, we will do it just out of uh, due respect for the public, uh, the media, um, the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the last one I participated in was uh, with regard to whether or not the governor had properly used the line item veto. And there was a good deal of interest just in our building and how we did that and how we would approach it. And so we brought the attorneys in and heard very fine presentations hmm. that were not a mere regurgitation of the record we had already read. The, uh, the, the country and the state and the city have been in a deep recession for a while. Has that affected the work on the court at all? Has the downturn in the economy had any... Uh, <laughs> direct impact on the Oklahoma Supreme Court? We have suffered over the last three years, including the fiscal year that we're just beginning, uh, about 22 to 23 percent cuts in the judiciary. Uh, I'm not saying that we're alone in that, but uh, we have had to cut funding to the district courts, the equivalent of the salaries of about 125 court fund funded deputy clerks. We've had to freeze out-of-state judicial uh, education, travel. We've had to freeze salaries. Uh, we've had to put freezes on uh, replacement and new hires. It's been uh, very difficult for us, and frankly, uh, that's probably the biggest challenge we face in the future. It's maintaining our financial capability to survive and bring the judiciary into the 21st century. What's the biggest challenge facing the court in the next decade? I think that's it, Your Honor. If we don't have the Bucks, we don't have the Buck Rogers. The paraphrase <laughs> Gus Grissom, I guess. They've got to adequately fund the judiciary. We only take 1% of the state's budget, and that budget is 95% personnel. If they cut the people who are serving the public, we're not going to be able to give them speedy access to justice, as is our responsibility under the Constitution. And will you be able to move into that new building sometime in the next year or so? I think we'll make a trail of tears movement sometime in the dead of this winter. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Chief Justice, thank you very much thank for coming on the verdict. Thank you so much. Thank you for your courtesy. It. Chief Justice James Edmondson, today's guest on the verdict. Kent and I'll be back with a final word right after this. naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. 
a place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political government and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers wrapping up a show with Chief Justice James Edmondson. I was startled uh, and surprised by the Chief Justice uh, pointing out that one of the three co-equal branches of government, the, uh, the judicial branch, co-equal with the legislative and executive branch, only has one percent of the state budget. Uh, they get an awful lot done <laughs> with very limited dollars and uh, they're all uh, to be commended for doing that. I might also say very briefly that uh, I think the highlight of uh, my professional career is, is the pleasure to argue before the Oklahoma Supreme Court in bank, which I've done a number of times, and they're always treated with dignity and respect and uh, better know what I'm talking about or, or they'll point it out. But uh, it's a great experience. We'll be back next week with another show. In the meantime, you can go to our website and tell us about a show that you'd like to see. Theverdict.tv is our web address. Until then, for Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.